Welcome to the public AI for You Cafe on April 1st at 3 p.m. The title today is Logic Programming. Is it logic or search? The speaker is today Peter Schuller. He is a postdoctoral researcher at Technical University of Vienna in Austria. My name is Carmen McWilliams and I'm the moderator and organizer. I'm the director of the company Grassroot Arts and partner in the AI for You project. Hi, Peter. Hi, Peter. Hi. We are slowly, as always, starting. So please take notice that the session will be recorded. You can find the recordings of all cafe sessions on the AI for You platform. No confidential information shall be shared in this cafe session. And in this cafe, the speaker expresses his personal view and opinion. This is not necessarily the official AI for you project opinion. I'm now moving the slide. Moment. What is the AI for you cafe about? The web cafe is an online program gain insights into the European AI scene. Participants get the chance to share knowledge and experiences and meet stakeholders in various areas of AI and research education. And as always, this is an interactive session, so please, there on the right side, you all have a panel and there's also, you can ask questions, there's chat and questions. You can type in your questions if you have some. And also you can raise your hand, you can click on a hand, and then I can give you the microphone after the cafe. And then you can ask your questions directly. So now I think I shall introduce Peter. Peter Schuller did his PhD at Technical University of Vienna on inconsistency in knowledge representation and his postdoc on cognitive robotics at Zabanki University in Istanbul and then worked on natural language processing as assistant professor in Mamara, Mamara University in Istanbul. He is postdoctoral researcher at the Technical University of Vienna in Austria, and he has a consulting company in Vienna focusing on system and database design with a bit of machine learning. So again, welcome, Peter, in our cafe. And I think... Hi. I hope you're good. Thank you. I'm very well. Thank you. I will now give you the moderator role so you can slowly start showing your presentation. I gave you now the moderator role and you could share the screen. Yes, we see it. Very good. Thank you very much. And I, I now this should work. Yes, it looks perfect. I see the algorithms. So, slide. And again, welcome. So should I already start now? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Introduction. Um, the title of my presentation, Logic Programming, is it logic or search? It is a question, but uh, my presentation will actually focus on introducing what is logic programming and what does it have to do with logic and search. So let's first start with a very basic thing of computer science, algorithms. What are algorithms? When students learn about computer science, usually they first learn algorithms. And this is a description, like a mechanical description, like a recipe, what the computer does to come from an input that the computer gets in the abstract way this is just a list of numbers to the output for example yeah for example the input is a list of numbers and the output is a sorted list of numbers and the person describes exactly what to get from the input to the output and algorithms this is more or less an accepted concept, can do everything that the computer can do. Whatever the computer is doing, 
it is always executing an algorithm. By the way, if you have questions, I think it is possible that you can ask them during the presentation. Yes. Maybe Carmen can explain how this should happen. Yes. I mean, it's, I can come one moment back. I explain once more. On the right side, you have either uh, chat questions. You can type them in and I, as soon as I read them, I will also tell Peter we can make maybe a break and then you can ask the question or you raise the hand. There is a hand symbol. If you see the hand, you can click on it and I know you want to ask a question and I give you the microphone. So these are the two possibilities. Okay. You can continue. Okay, thank you very much. I will continue. This was the, what, the, what are algorithms? This was the explanation of algorithms. Now the second thing is, the second important topic of this talk is logics. So what is a logic? Originally, this was not in computer science, this was in philosophy. And philosophers said, we want to describe the world in a mathematical way. So they invented logic. Logic is a mathematical description of the world and a mathematical description of knowledge. And there are clear rules in logic that, that it is possible to formulate clear rules in logic, how to compute truth, what is true and what is false. And how to judge that is written down mathematically to get to infer more, more knowledge, like humans do reasoning. Uh, here we see on the right side an example of a puzzle. And we can think of logics like, okay, we know when the puzzle is correct, but if I have all the pieces, it is not so clear how to get to that final state. So before we had algorithms, those are recipes. And now with logics, we know what are the rules of the game, but we don't know how to reach the goal. That's not so clear. But we can describe the goal and we can check if the goal is reached or not. And what happens with logic? Logic, of course, is not, it's not distant to algorithms. We need algorithms to work on logic, what is true and what is false in logics. And to work with logics in computer science, we use algorithms. And these algorithms, they are normal algorithms, but they often have to do trial and error. They have to search to find a solution, like in this puzzle on the right side of the slide, to find this maybe the only solution to this puzzle. Now there is a chat message. Okay. For me. This was just the message for everyone <laughs> that they can ask questions. Hi. Now I explained what algorithms are, what logics are. And now to the title of this talk, what is logic programming? That's somehow the combination of both. In logic programming, we use program properties of the world, what is true, what is false, what might be true, what cannot be true. And it looks really like a computer program. I will show examples later. And then based on that program, we have another program that is an algorithm that is called the solver. And this program uh, computes based on our logic program, what are the possible worlds, it's called possible worlds, that obey all the rules that were described in the program. So it can be that we have a program and there is no solution because we say, okay, the traffic light has to be green and it has to be red at the same time. And we say a traffic light cannot be green and red at the same time. Then the solver would say, there is no world where this is possible. There can that have many possible worlds. If we just say the traffic light can be green or yellow or red, and we have 100 traffic lights, 
we get millions of uh, possible worlds, all combinations of traffic lights, and the solver would compute them. So this way we can write in a program how the world is supposed to look like, and we can also ask questions on this description. And this is logic programming. And now we might ask, why do we need logic programming? Why is that useful? Well, compared to the algorithms before, we now have only one algorithm, which is the solver. And we can always use the same universal algorithm for solving, for answering questions. Peter? Ich bin so. Um, Peter, I, I think your connection with the videos, uh, there is a problem. So maybe what is that useful? Maybe you have to in the moment stop a little bit with the video and just talk okay. because and then we try later again. It's maybe better for the bandwidth. Okay, I shut down my no. video. Right. Now yeah. I shut down my video and the screen yeah. should be visible again. Should I repeat this slide on the usefulness or was the audio okay? Yes. Was the audio okay before? Now, now audio is okay and now audio is okay. I, I think it's good to repeat why is that useful. I think it's better. Okay, I will repeat this because I can also hear only part of the audio at the moment. So why is it useful? The advantage of logic programs over algorithms is that a logic program uh, can use a universal algorithm to answer the questions in the program. We don't need a new algorithm always. We can focus on describing the world and what questions we have regarding the world. We can focus on this problem and we don't need to focus on how this is how the result is computed yes this is the essence we don't need to focus on how it is computed because the solver is doing that and we can focus on what now i'm coming to the next slide Logic programming is not one thing. There are two big schools of logic programming we could say. We can see they have two different heads on the left and on the right side of the slide. Uh, because these schools are often competitors and they don't like the philosophy of the other school, but they both have their benefits, both schools. What are the two schools? The older one is the Prolog way of doing of doing logic programming. Prolog uh, starts from a question, a logical question, and searches for a specific answer to that question in the logic program. Prolog requires the author of the program to know a bit about the algorithm, how Prolog will evaluate the program and the big advantage of Prolog is that it can work with huge amounts of data because it only looks into the data that is relevant to the question. On the other hand, the other school of logic programming is answer set programming. This is the more recent school of logic programming and this is based on database technology and satisfiability solving. This is the type of logic programming that I am most working with in my research. And this school of logic programming starts from known facts and searches for possible worlds in these known facts. And everything that is written down in knowledge is part of this search. The Disadvantage of this is that big amounts of data, there is an A missing in this last sentence, big amounts of data make problems for answer set programming. 
But the advantage is that the user does not need to know about the algorithm, how this is solved. Usually, the solver will find a good way to find solutions to the program. And one important uh, benefit that is often cited for answer set programming is elaboration tolerance, which means we can describe really what we want to know or what we know about the world and the solver tool will deal with it. We don't need to know about the algorithm. Now I come to examples. There is first an example, Sudoku in answer set programming. We have here as an example, we describe what are X coordinates one to nine, what are Y coordinates one to nine, and what are the numbers that we can put into the fields of Sudoku one to nine. And then we have one rule that states for every X coordinate and every Y coordinate, we have to put exactly one of the possible numbers into this Sudoku field. And this creates all possible grids with numbers. And then the next rules, they are a bit more complicated. They define these parts of the Sudoku field that have to contain unique numbers. And these three rules, they are called constraints. They define which solutions are illegal. For example, a solution where the same Y value, the same uh, two fields in one row of the Sudoku field with the same Y value have the same number, those solutions are illegal. And then if there are two, if there is a column in the Sudoku field where two fields have the same number, this is an illegal solution. And that's all. And then if we put this program into an ASP solver, into an answer set program solver, it will give us most of the time the first Sudoku it finds that obeys these rules. But if we want, we can also enumerate all possible Sudokus that exist using this source code. There is a second example, Sudoku in Prolog. This looks very different. It uses some special library and it is uh, it describes more an algorithm how to create this. More or less, this is one single rule, this whole program. And this rule is shown here. Oh, sorry. It describes, okay, there is a list of things called rows. There are nine of them. They all have the same length. To fill them with numbers one to nine, they must be all distinct. Then, we can transpose them also. The columns must also be distinct. And then these blocks are also defined to be, uh, and then the blocks constraints must be true. Those are the last three. And the blocks constraints are defined here below as helper constraints. Um, again, with the all distinct functionality, which is from a library. And then finally, we ask a question to the program. Give me one or give me all Sudokus and we transform it into a way that we can see actually the result. So this is just for illustration. To write this program is, uh, this is not my own program, first of all. And to write or understand this program is complicated. I only show this to illustrate the difference between the schools of logic programming. Before um, we had 
Hello. Hello, Peter. I, yeah. I'm interrupting you. I don't know if it's good now. There are many questions. <laughs> okay, okay. I is think it, it is good. It's good? Okay, so I can read them. Um, uh, I start with uh, Jack Rubin. Jack Rubin. So he asks, so ASP is forward chaining rules like production systems, he asks. This was the question. Yeah, that was the first question. Uh, is ASP forward chaining rules like production systems? The questions are in the questions. Um, <laughs> yes, I could see only one of the questions, which was not a question, because I cannot scroll in that window. The window I, is. So I, is, I read it. It's like he asked first, is ASP is forward chaining rules like production system? And secondly, what is the difference with forward and backward chaining? Is Jill so ASP, ASP is doing okay? I will to conserve bandwidth. I will deactivate the camera again because the audio is also bad. So to answer the first question, is ASP forward chaining? Not only, but also ASP is forward chaining to instantiate a problem space and then it is using SAT solving to evaluate possible worlds. So in this case, this rule here forward chains, but it contains a guess in the head of the rule and the production system cannot deal with such a guess. That's why first it's forward chains. This is called grounding or instantiation. And then it uses a SAT solver to evaluate which uh, guesses, uh, which possibilities obey all constraints in the program. Okay. Does this answer the question? Ah, there was yes. the second question. What is forward chaining and backward chaining? Yes. In, in the essence, answer set programming does forward chaining plus search and uh, Prolog does backward chaining plus search. Okay. More, more precisely, ASP does forward chaining followed by search, and Prolog does backward chaining interleaved with search. Okay. I of course techniques I in answer set uh, to, to decrease the search space, but this is uh, this is not the essence of how it is evaluated. Okay. I have one more question. Yeah. Peter, you still there? Yes. Yes. This yes, I'm still there. Yes. <laughs> Jack, why are there two ones surrounding Sodo? I mean, this is like a very special question. I uh, where? Why are there two ones surrounding? Parentheses Sudoku, parentheses X, comma Y, comma N, comma parentheses two ones, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the lower, the left one of these predicates of these atoms, that is true, and the up, the right one is the upper bound. We must find at most one. So if we say x1, y2, then for x1, y2, we will have nine possibilities for n. And from these nine, we must find at least one and at most one that is true. All the others must be false. Mm -hmm. These numbers I wrote are now the, an example for one forward chain instantiation of that rule. And there will be nine times nine forward chaining instantiations because nine times nine different values for X and nine different values for Y. And each of these rules has nine types of Sudoku in this bracket with at least one and at most one, two. Thank you. 
Okay. I have one more question. <laughs> yes. Uh, the same man, Jack, asked, wouldn't it be more interesting to compare ASP with CLP, paragraph, uh, parentheses, FD, parentheses, closed? So wouldn't it be more interesting to compare SP with CLP? I would answer to that that to use Prolog in a really efficient way and to write nice programs, most people have to use CLP as a library it compares then ASP with CLP because this is a library for, sorry, no, I'm painting, didn't want that. So this, now I want to paint again. This library that is used here, for example, with the all distinct properties, this is part of the constraint logic programming. Okay. Okay, so I think we are now, um, I have two more questions, but uh, we can also do them afterwards, but uh, I can say from Nick, he asked, this is actually, or he says, this is actually constrained logic pro programming, CLP, not good old prolog. That's what Nick Basiliadis says. What do you think? I think this is true. But to write Sudoku in real good old fashioned Prolog, it would never fit one screen. <laughs> this would be my explanation. Okay. And I think using a library, I mean, using, using a library is not a bad thing. It does not, it does not disturb the, the usefulness of the formalism. And the difference between the two logic programming formalisms can be seen in this uh, in this example too. But maybe this is a personal opinion. Mm -hmm. So I'm, we are closing now because I think we are getting too long. There are maybe the questions which are coming. There are more questions coming, um, but I think we should continue with the presentation and then afterwards ask more questions. So I think it's time to go on, please. Okay. So I saw in the questions that the chat was, that audio was good and that it was bad. So mm -hmm. let's try, let's try if it will be good. Okay. Now the painting of the previous slide, sorry. I will erase it, good. Uh, actually, I'm already at the, conclusion of this talk. Um, the logic, logic programming, in conclusion, it combines logic and algorithms. It is more comfortable than directly writing algorithms in any case. So logic programs are computed more efficiently than directly writing algorithms. Of course, logic programs are not the solution for everything, but for search problems, often a logic program is a good solution. And uh, there are, of course, some limitations and active research topics that I would like to mention. Um, the world is using a lot of machine learning at the moment, and logic programming, programming and machine learning um, it is not yet totally clear what's the best way to combine it. There are many approaches and uh, this is current research. For example, probabilistic logic programming, where we can say a rule is not totally true. We probabilist a probability that the rule is true. And from that, we can compute the most probable uh, world. But there are many other 
ways to combine probabilities with logic programming or fuzzy logic with logic programming. And then finally, the integration. If we really have a machine learning algorithm that classifies images uh, or a, a neural network that computes the likelihood of sequences and how to combine this with logic programming, which is Boolean. So logic programming is always about truth values, true or false or unknown in some cases. And how to combine this with machine learning and neural networks where everything is a floating point number. This is a part of current research where I'm also working on in the integration. It's my conclusion slide. So finally, I want to thank you for your attention and uh, I'm open for more questions. Yes, thank you, Peter. And I suggest uh, uh, that the questions, you have a lot of questions come in from Jack and from Nick, that you maybe go on microphone <laughs> if you're willing. If you're willing to do so, then just uh, raise your hand because um, else I'm reading them. It's also fine, I'm reading your questions. But if you feel like discussing directly, then just raise your hand. I can give you the microphone. If you have a problem finding this hand, <laughs> then um, uh, ask me in the chat. So, but I'm reading the questions, but before I'm going back in the questions of the participants, I have a more generic question. Um, Peter, when you say you are working uh, also next to your research, you're working in a consulting company, what are you doing there with your programming, basically? I'm using mostly the database part of the logic programming. Um, I'm doing I'm doing a lot of work with databases and big data. Mm -hmm and also a bit of machine learning. Um, I'm working with one company that uh, is actually now working on the coronavirus crisis to create an app that automatically tracks who had contact with whom, anonymized, and tries to make the work of the detectives in the health sector more easy to find out who should be tested next. And such applications yes. the big the data is so big that real logic programming is not yet applicable unfortunately mm -hmm. but the database the database expertise of uh, how to efficiently search in databases and how to work with databases this is very relevant there yeah. okay thank you now back to the audience i just had to ask my Generic question. Here, Peter van der Linn. Dear Peter, thanks for the presentation. Do you have an explanation why logical programming takes so long to be adopted? This is a very good question. I think the problem is the, the difficulty with interacting with other formalisms. We have no, I mean, we have. I take my video out. I'm, I'm maybe the bandwidth is better. We don't hear you. Try oh. once more. Once more. Okay, I will try again. My video is already off. Um, my explanation would be that the, that the application programming interfaces and the integrations with other formalisms like Java, Python are not yet at the stage where this uh, this is easy to do. This would be my explanation why it takes so long to be adopted. On the other hand, also the amount of people who are really skilled in logic programming, I think it's not so large. In Prolog, it was even larger many years ago when the, when the good old fashioned AI was more fashionable. In of missing missing skill in the average programmer, so that the average programmer will not have the idea to use logic programming. 
from in the first place. So this would be my okay my answer to this. Thank you. Now I have Jack. Jack, I see your hand rise, and yes, it's a few minutes. Now I will give you the microphone because you have many questions. I hope I hear you. Hi, Jack. Can you speak? Hi, Jack. Hello, Jack. I don't hear you yet. We don't hear you. Hello. Yes, now I can hear something. Yes. Ah, uh, you can. Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> okay, so uh, maybe I could follow up a bit on on the answer by by Peter on why. Uh, the lack of adoption of logic programming. Uh, I mean, there is a, a tool called SWI Prolog, Sweet Prolog, that has fairly good integration with other with other uh, technology, and you can use it even as a Docker container and exchange data with JSON. So I'm not sure if it's still true that the problem is tooling for interfaces with other tools. However, uh, it's true that the, in terms of teaching, I mean, most most uh, software engineer have never heard of it. So, yes. Uh, and and it's a complete di complete different way of thinking. Because you're not just writing algorithm; you just declare what's true, what's false, what's probable, what's not probable. So it's really more modeling than programming, and it's disconcerting at first. Maybe I can also add to that. The problems we solve with logic programming are usually the problems that programmers try to avoid at all, because they have so high complexity that any algorithm is just, it's just, uh, it's, it's getting out of bounds. So we are, we are usually dealing with NP hard problems, NP complete problems. This is the class that is, for example, solved by onset programming, or even above that. And for example, programmers that write algorithms, um, for example, in the GCC compiler, not even allowed to add N to the third algorithms to there, or only with special permission because this would just slow down the software. So maybe there is also a very big reluctance to solve so hard problems, for which logic programming is a good tool. Yeah, okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Peter, for your answer. My last question was, uh, is there research on probabilistic ASP or, or, or not at all? That would be an equivalent uh, Yes, there is there okay. is quite some research on probabilistic ASP. There is research on combining uh, Markov logic uh, networks within ASP. LPMLN is called. This is called LPMLN. Uh, this is an those are integrative formalisms between Markov logic networks and and answer set programmers. Hello. Probabilistic ASP formalisms. Yes. I just didn't hear you. There's sometimes, uh, unfortunately, there's sometimes. But I, we heard you. It was just like I think some words. Yeah, yeah and let the, and another question: is, is the performance of ASP somehow limited by the inter underlying uh, SAT solver that it translates to? Certainly. And interestingly, for example, the Klingo solver, the CLASP solver that is in the Klingo software, it was developed a lot. And after that, it was winning the SAT competitions in some categories. So this is an interesting side effect of this, that this SAT solver development can really, really directly translate into efficiency of answer set solvers. Okay, and is there some ASP platform that uh, translates to MiniZinc? Sorry? 
I didn't. Is there any ASP engine that translates to MiniZinc? I think uh, in. I could check on that. Okay. I know that there are ASP researchers uh, in the US that worked on MiniSync 2. I could I could check up and let you know. Okay. okay thank you. You're welcome. I would also let now I read a question because I don't see the hand. Uh, I, Alessandro, it's you. Um, Alessandro Safioti, the question is, you worked on inconsistency. How are inconsistent data dealt with by ASP or by Prolog? Can you give an example? Okay, this is a good, this is a good point. An inconsistency in Boolean space is usually um, that something is claimed to be true by one part of the system and is claimed to be false by another part of the system. So the standard way of dealing with inconsistency is to make a guess over which rule is correct and which rule is incorrect and then find a solution that is consistent with the minimum amount of rules that were judged as incorrect. Of course, this is not always the truth, but this gives an insight into what is the reason for the inconsistency, and this is very much related to diagnosis. So this is, I know only about is how Prolog deals with inconsistencies, I do not know. Okay, I don't hear you anymore. I stopped. I stopped talking after saying that I don't know how Prolog deals with inconsistency. Okay, thank you. Are you ready for one more question? Yes. <laughs> you say when you here, Jill. Jill Fayat. He has uh, N N allowed to do the feature extraction that caused issues of knowledge capture and brittleness when we were using logic programming back in the nineties. How does it work with NN? And if it works with closed search spaces, how would you compare it with RL? So, neural networks with reinforcement learning, I guess, or. Uh, Okay, logic programming works works with closed search spaces. Yes, although there are well, no, that is that is too general. That cannot be said like that. Okay, how to answer this question? If um, it's to ask uh, come on the microphone if you if you want, yeah, if it's too complex. That's also possible, but I would say that reinforcement learning is really learning. And in answer set programming, we usually do not learn rules. We and the reason. Now we could use neural networks to extract features and to reason over those features. There is also research on that, that a neural network makes object detection and detects uh, a door, a window, and a wheel of a car in an object. And then these features go into an answer set program and the answer set program says, is this consistent or not? And which features from the neural network could we, what is the minimum amount of wrong features from the neural network that makes the scene consistent? So for example, in this case, if the car wheel if one window was recognized as a car wheel, then we would say, okay, we assume that the whole thing is a house because we have the roof, we have the window, we have the door, and the car wheel was just a hiccup of the neural network. There are 
Okay. There are three wheels and so on, and doors. And we have a chimney, then we, the program would say, okay, the chimney doesn't fit the car, and most of the thing is in the car. So the most consistent way of the scene is a car, and we ignore this part of the neural network feature. That's, uh, that would be my take to answer this question. But ASP by itself, it does not learn. The search algorithm learns internally, but they are not, uh, it does not learn new rules. That would be inductive logic programming, which also exists, but I would prefer not to go into that topic right now. Okay, thank you. And I have now one uh, person, Nick Basiliadis. He wants to ask questions, and I will give you now, Nick, the microphone if you are ready. Uh, I'm trying to give you the microphone and let's hear. Nick, you have the microphone. Maybe you try to speak. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, but you have to speak louder. <laughs> okay, good evening everybody. This is Nick from Greece. Uh, thank you, Peter, for this very nice uh, talk. Um, uh, I would like to ask you, um, you earlier it was mentioned that um, uh, SWI Prolog is uh, a very, let's say, popular uh, a version of uh, Prolog. Uh, what about ASP? What uh, would be the most popular tool and um, compared to SWI, who I, I believe you, you know this tool, mm -hmm. uh, how it is compared, let's say, to popularity to users? Uh, do you happen to know? Yes, certainly. Thank you for the question. Um, the most popular tool for ASP is Klingo, which is the combination of Clark and Gringo, which is a software developed by uh, Thorsten Schaub and his group in, in Germany, in Potsdam. And this is also, for example, installable in Conda, just with Conda install Cpotasco. Klingo, and this comes with a Python library, Python integration, where everything can be done from Python. And it, it also uh, allows easy exchange of models and rules between the program. So there is such an API there. In high, on a high level, this is a very low level integration, which is good, of course, but a high level integration for, uh, for other programming paradigms. There are integrations for object oriented programming and ASP to map. And they are based on the Klingo API, for example. But this is all work in progress, and these libraries, I think, need more development for better adoption. Great, thanks. And if I may uh, ask another question as well? Yes. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> uh, you, you were saying that you are currently working on uh, integrating uh, logic programming with uh, machine learning and neural networks. Uh, can you be a bit elaborate on this or it's a long story? Sorry, uh, I said that I'm integrating logic programming with machine learning and neural networks. Um, actually in this project, in the AI for EU project, I'm working on integrating uh, OWL API with logic programming for industrial key use cases where OWL ontologies and description logics are used to describe effectively, but we want to, the OWL, OWL is used for static descriptions and we want to do planning, production planning in these factories, which is dynamic aspect. And so the answer set programming does the dynamic aspect of the planning and the uh, all on screen. 
We are losing you, Peter. Oh, yeah, that's... Also, I did not understand the... I guessed the question before, but the audio is not good, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately, it's something. So maybe, maybe I suggest that we slowly um, close down. I will announce the next session. And if you have more questions, maybe you... Peter will be available for answering the email if 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 there's are you maybe available for email? <laughs> yes, I'm available for email. Okay, so maybe if there's some other burning question, please send to Peter or me directly the question because the audio is unfortunately not perfect today. And so I change now the moderator back to me. First, of course, I want to say a thousand thanks to Rupert and um, also to all the participants, these interesting questions. And uh, also the presentation is available and the recording um, afterwards. Um, and so if you want to have the recording or presentation, just drop an email to me and this will be fine. And so now we're coming to the end uh, again as always i announce the next one the next live cafe session will be uh, on april 8th um, and this time the title is combating biased ai using blockchain technology it's by unbiased it's a company called unbiased uh, founded by sukesh kumar tedler who is the speaker uh, and afterwards or before, it's not super clear yet. We have another session on April 8th, uh, and our coordinator, Patrick Gatley from AI for You, he will inform about the ICT call 49, how to collaborate with AI for You. Uh, this invitation will come also next week to you. Uh, please write me comments. If you want to be yourself a speaker, we have in the moment a special call for speakers. Um, we call this AI Robotics versus COVID-19 initiative. So if you feel like using the cafe to uh, share ideas or tools or um, whatever, which could help in this crisis, please also inform me. And we make a special session in this cafe. It can be any time. This has not to be in this Wednesday series, can be any time. So please uh, just drop an email if you feel like. There will be soon some sessions coming, uh, especially on 3D printing of masks uh, and other subjects. So uh, thank you again and stay healthy. And I'm putting back my image. <laughs> So bye-bye, everybody, and have a nice day. Thank you, Peter. No? Thank you. So have, you stay too. healthy and see you soon. Bye-bye. No? Bye-bye. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye.